today on the show, it's our Game of Thrones Season 4 recap. We're going to get you caught up and ready for Season 5, going over all the major events and major players and key things that happened. And then we're going to talk about some things I'm looking forward to in Season 5, as well as some things that I don't know what's going to happen in Season 5, because they're totally going to have to divert from the books. So here's how our recap is going to go down. We're going to talk about five different locations and all the character storylines within those locations. So first up, we have the North. You have Jon Snow, Sam, Gilly, Bran Stark, and not to mention Theon's storyline. Then you also have Dragonstone with Stannis and Melisandre, who end up in the North at the end. Over in the Eyrie, you have Sansa and Peter Baelish's storyline. And I'm going to count Arya and the Hound in the Eyrie because that's where they're headed towards. Then... Uh, over in King's Landing, we have all the Lannisters at home. They're having all sorts of family drama this season. And on top of that, you have Oberyn Martell and his antics, as well as Brian of Tarth. And then finally, last but not least, we have Daenerys in Marine over in Essos. We're going to talk about all of that stuff as well. Today's episode is sponsored by Space Wolf Limited. Recently, they have produced another beautiful Game of Thrones poster. This time, it is the map of Westeros. It looks so beautiful. Oh, wow. And not only is it gorgeous, it's also super helpful because when you're watching the show, you're going to be like, wait, where the fuck is Moe Kalen? And you're going to go, oh, yeah, there it is. It's right there. Wait, where the fuck is the Eerie? Oh, yeah, there it is. So it's got a practical purpose. Wow, it's like one of those things where you can find out where everything's at on a map. It's yeah, like a map. It is like a map. You're totally right, robot. You, nothing gets by you. Uh, and normally, Space Wolf only does... 50, but for the Westeros map, he has made 100. These are still available online, but he also does more than just Game of Thrones stuff. Recently, he has also started a Guardians of the Galaxy series. Oh, I've heard of that before. Yeah, yeah. Rocket Raccoon is also still available right now, uh, but this one is only 50. It's in short supply. Uh, also, he recently has started doing some mini posters. Mini posters? So for those of you who cannot afford the 11 by 17 size, he's made Look a smaller one. I know, it's so cute. Baby Groot, what a little peach he is. Um, so yeah, but Baby Groot, unfortunately, I believe is sold out. And so is the Xenomorph that he just did. It was so gorgeous. Oh my gosh. So you really got to jump on these things like super fast. And right now, if you use the promo code CBG19, you can get $50 off. That's 25% off. And Space Wolf is also conscious of our environment. He realizes that he is killing trees by making this art. So to make up for that, he is planting one tree for everything he sells. He's been planting thousands of trees. It's ridiculous. He also uses packing peanuts made out of starch and they're biodegradable. My cat eats them uh, all the time. I've chewed on one. It, it doesn't really taste like anything. I might be poisoned right now. I don't know. I probably shouldn't put those things in my mouth, but I do anyways. Because they're delicious. Because they're delicious. So you can go on spacewolflimited.com, promo code CBG19 to get 25% off everything in his store. So check it out, guys. <laughs> First up, let's talk about the wall in Castle Black. You have Jon Snow, who has escaped from the Wildlings from season three, and now he's back at the castle, and he's having to deal with all the ramifications of being a double agent and how people don't trust him anymore, and everyone's questioning him and all this craziness. What, what, why was he a double agent? Um, because Corrin Halfhand instructed him to do so. He says, slay me, because they both got captured by the Wildlings in season three. Kill me, let them take you in, find out everything you can, and then go back to Castle Black or Go back to your brothers whenever you can and tell them what's going on. Then what happens? So he's back at the wall with Sam and Gilly. Gilly's also at the wall, but Sam's freaked out because he thinks everyone's going to rape her. So he makes her go to Mole's Town and work in a whorehouse, which is like, well, that's where people are having sex all the time. But whatever. That's not a good plan. <laughs> Anyways, Gilly ends up coming back after the, the Finns like eat everybody's ass over there. So it's fine. She's fine. She goes Finns back to the wall. Ass? They'll eat anything. They eat it all. They don't waste anything in the North. Then what happens? So you have Jon Snow, and he's just trying to tell everybody, like, look, there's, like, all these fucking wildlings, and, like, they are coming for us, and, like, we have got to do this. But we have to do this. We have got to take care of this problem. One of the things that they have to take care of is at Craster's Keep, you have all the mutineers from season three, the black brothers who killed their leader, uh, Mormont, uh, Jorah's dad. They killed him, and then now they're, like, drinking out of his cartoon skull. Whatever. So they go back there, 
and they kill all the mutineers. And also, Locke is at the wall. He's looking for Bran Stark, uh, and he ends up finding him, but ends up dying because Hodor kills him. Well, Bran has Hodor kills him. Then what happens? And then finally, there's the epic conclusion of the wildlings coming down on Castle Black. There's the giant climactic fight scene. It was super crazy. Why are the wildlings coming down in the first place? Because of the White Walkers. They're like, dude, we don't want to be turned into White Walkers. Like, please just let us pass your wall. Like, we don't want to kneel to your king, but like, we don't want to be turned into White Walkers. We're not here to conquer. We are here to hide behind your wall. So it's just a big misunderstanding. Pretty much, yeah, because they just like, they associate wildlings with the other, you know? So they just like repel them at all costs, even though it's like, they're doing them a favor by trying to come over because if the wildlings stay in the north and they're all turned into like part of the, the other army, then that's just gonna be more zombies that people are gonna have to kill. Yeah, then what happens? They've had enough for one night. So. Castle Black makes it through the big deal. They, they are not taken in their first night, although they are still like tons of wildlings and they're gonna have a second volley coming at them. They'll outnumber us a thousand to one. So Jon Snow is like, look, you know, I'm just gonna go over there. I'm gonna try to kill the king beyond the wall. You're going to kill him? I'm gonna try. So if I kill him, maybe they'll scatter and we don't have to worry about this. Maybe that'll save the whole deal. So he goes over there, he talks to him. Are you capable of that, Jon Snow? Killing a man in his own tent when he's just offered you peace. Is that what the Night's Watch is? The guy's like, oh my god, you're gonna kill me? Dude, I thought we were just having a peace treaty. Like, what the fuck's wrong with you? Which, he's totally right. John shouldn't have been a bitch like that in the first place. <laughs> but then, when they're talking, Stannis Baratheon shows up and fucking takes care of all the wildlings, takes them all prisoner, and the King Beyond the Wall prisoner. Uh, and so he asks John, he's like, well, should I fucking kill this King Beyond the Wall? And John's like, you know what? He captured me, he was cool to me, you should be cool to him and hear what he has to say because, you know, he's a reasonable fucking guy. So he does. So that's the end? Yeah, he burns Ygritte, she dies. Uh, that was really sad. Uh, and that's about it for Jon Snow. But where is Jon Snow going now? Okay, so Jon Snow is obviously still at Castle Black, but now so is Stannis and Melisandre. And so that is obviously going to play into a lot of weird political bullshit going on at the wall. Also, there is no Lord Commander right now, and pretty soon they're going to have to elect a Lord Commander. That's going to be a big deal probably going on this season that I'm looking forward to seeing. How did you feel about the wall overall? Besides the Craster's Keep mutineer thing, and that's what we're going to talk about in changes from book to show in that episode, uh, I, I thought they did a really great job. I didn't think they did the best they could with the uh, budget they had to do this giant war scene with against the wildlings. Uh, that epic shot, that really long shot that they did was really cool. I appreciate that. So it was good. Oh yeah, and John finally gets back with his wolf because like their CGI budget won't let him have a wolf. So finally the wolf's back, but then he's back in a cage somewhere. So off screen. <laughs> Ever since Bran left Winterfell uh, after Theon came to visit and tried to take over, uh, he has been traveling north with his traveling companions. So now it's just Bran, Hodor, Mira, and Jojen, and they're going north. And in season three, they went from one side of the wall to the other side of the wall. So now they are in the true north. Uh, headed towards that three-eyed raven every day. And on their way, they end up uh, hanging by Craster's Keep. They see what's going on there and they find ghosts there. And Bran's like, wait, they have ghosts, but my brother John isn't there and like, what's going on? And so they end up getting captured because they look like a Scooby-Doo gang. They weren't even like hiding very well in the fucking bushes when they were spying. Um, so they get captured. Uh, Mira gets threatened with rape. Jojen gets threatened with being killed. They're here, the night's watch. escaping in the chaos when the Black Brothers come and take over and try to kill all the mutineers. Uh, they get away in that. Bran sees John and he has the opportunity to, you know, say, John, I'm here, I'm alive. But he doesn't because he knows that John will force him to go back with him to Castle Black and therefore he will not be able to see the Three-Eyed Raven, which is his ultimate deal in life. So he decides not to say hello to his brother John, his half brother John, and decides to continue north with his traveling companions, uh, which is a really tough deal. It's like really cold, it sucks, there's not a lot of food. Like Jojen is like freaking out, like he's like not doing so fucking well. Hodor must have lost a lot of weight. Uh, <laughs> it didn't look like he lost any weight, but you know, he, he got, uh, he just got battered around a lot. 
But they finally get to the place that they're trying to get to, this this giant heart tree, they get, they get to it, and there's a cave there, and they're, they're almost there, and then all these Sinbad, White Walker, other dudes pop up out of the ground. Well, they're the thralls or whatever, but they pop up out of the ground. What's a thrall? Well, it's like a zombie. It's like they're not, you know, they're not magical beings. They're just like zombies that... Then what happens? So they fight off these skeletons. Uh, there's a child of the forest there, and she throws some magic bombs, and they end up going inside the cave, and he finally meets the Three-Eyed Raven, which is this guy who is attached into the roots of the heart tree, and he can see through the heart tree and all the heart trees in Westeros and wherever there's heart trees. He can also warg and go to the past and the future and all the stuff. So Bran's like, oh, are you going to teach me how to walk again? And the guy's like, no, I'm going to teach you how to fly, motherfucker. You ain't never going to walk again. And it's like, dude, Bran, do you not see what's going on? It's like this guy's attached to a tree. He can never move. Like, he has no use of his legs. You have no use of your legs right now. So you're going to obviously take his fucking spot, bro. Like, you're his intern. You know, Bran is gonna become this dude's intern. He's got the right stuff. So is that it? Yeah, that's it. And I heard that in the next season, in season five, there will be no Bran or Hodor story because this is the end of the story in the books. So uh, they don't know what the fuck is gonna happen with Bran. I don't know what the fuck's gonna happen with Bran. I guess we'll find out in season six what happens with Bran. But by then he'll probably be like 21 years old and have a beard, you know? Yeah, he's been growing a lot. Damn, all these kids have just been shooting up. Sansa's 30 feet tall. I know. It's like you watch Sally Draper on Mad Men. They can't get her to grow up fast enough. But like these kids like will not stop growing. I don't know what the deal is. What are the actors going to do during their time off? Um, well, I heard that Hodor uh, does Rave of Thrones where he DJs at raves with the Game of Thrones theme. Oh, uh, here we go. That's a pretty sweet gig, yeah, yeah. If uh, Rave of Thrones comes near here, we'll, we'll go, I guess, I, I don't know. <laughs> sure. You'll be a hit, actually, Robot. I think people will like you at the rave. Yeah. Boltons is that they are highborn lords who like to use skinning people alive as a method of bumming everyone out and getting what they want. So they terrify everybody with their bullshit. They are just really awful people. They're like the worst of the north, you know? Wait, like, does that work out for them? It does work out for them, actually. It does work out. Now that the Starks are out of the way, you know, it's like they really don't have anybody in their way anymore. And that's why they send Locke to go find Bran uh, and Rinkin just to make sure that no fucking Stark's gonna pop back up. Because if a Stark pops up at all, all the Northern countrymen will say, fuck off Boltons, Starks. They would much rather have anybody than the Boltons rule. Anybody, but especially a Stark, because the Starks have ruled since like forever, okay? They've been like the rulers of the North, the kings of the North. You know, they got the blood of the first men. They got all that stuff going on. What did you do to him? I trained him. He was a slow learner. But he learned. The dad comes back and he's like, hey, uh, you kind of cut off Theon's dick and I was going to use him as like a thing to trade so we could get Moat Kaelin back, but you fucked that up for me. So, you know what, you need to prove yourself and you need to take Moat Kaelin back for me. And then if you do that, which is just kind of a suicide mission, if you do that, then I will accept you and not hate on you. Because right now, Ramsay, you're really disappointing me with your uncontrollable, sadistic ways. So Ramsay says, okay, and he takes Theon and he makes Theon pretend he's Theon again. If we yield, we live. Is that what he says on this paper here? Yes. And they go take the castle and they trick the dude and they end up flaying all the friggin' ironborn there and then they have the north back. So, because Moat Kalen's on like the neck. So like if the ironborn are holding that, then like people can't freely go up into the north because it's like there's the north and there's the neck. Neck, little, and then there's the south. So it's a very strategic area. So because of this action, Ramsay is placed as not a bastard anymore. His father recognizes him as his heir. So Ramsay is now an official Bolton, something that he's always wanted. He finally got his comeuppance and he's so proud of himself. He's so happy. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. Yara tries to come back. This also didn't happen in the books. Yara tries to come back and save Theon and then Theon is so fucked up that he like bites her or something and she just leaves and is like, fuck him, never mind. Make for the ship, now. For your brother. My brother's dead. What about Stannis? <laughs> Rightful king. 
Is he going to become king now? I am now faced with a great opportunity, and I am powerless to take advantage of it. We'll find you an army, of Grace. I've been working day and night. What progress have you made? Okay, so Stannis is on Dragonstone for most of the season. Uh, he's over there. He's been beaten badly at the Blackwater, if you remember. Uh, so he's kind of reeling from that, and he still is trying to press his claim, but he doesn't know how he's going to do it because he doesn't have any money. He doesn't have any people fighting for him. He doesn't have any ships. I mean, he does, but it's, like, not enough to, like, pff, who cares, you know? So he's kind of in a pickle right now, which means that Ser Davos, his right hand, his hand of the king, is also in a pickle. All right, so he's got to figure some shit out for Stannis because Stannis is like, dude, like, if I go down, you go down. So he's like, gets the idea when he's talking to Shireen, uh, taking some reading lessons from Shireen, which, by the way, I love Sir Davos and Shireen. That's like the best interactions. I suppose if you work for the Iron Bank of Bravos and each one of your gold barges is worth half a kingdom, you tend not to be overly concerned with the kind of distinction. Uh, so anyways, he gets the idea from Shireen that, hey, why don't we go to the Iron Bank and be like, give us a loan, bro, because we're the rightful king and whatever. Bank? Okay, so the Iron Bank, uh, Tywin has a really great line about the Iron Bank. He says, we all live in its shadow and almost none of us know it. Uh, they are the financial institution uh, in both you know, Essos and Westeros. You know, I mean, they have just shit tons of money. They have all the gold. So... And they don't fuck around, you know? I mean, if you owe them money, like, and you don't pay it back, they will fund your enemies to fucking kill you and then take their gold back. So, I mean, like, they are a ruthless institution, just like banks are today. <laughs> so it's the same shit. Yeah, so, they, so they go all the way over to Bravos. You get to see the Titan, which was really cool, even though I'd rather see Arya see it for the first time because that was way more cool, but whatever. So they go there, they wait for this these fucking bankers, you know, and at first the bankers are like, Pfft. You're, just get out of here, you know? And then Sir Davos is like, has Stannis' back and is just like, look, Tywin Lannister, how fucking old is that guy? Like, he's the guy who's really in charge over there, okay? And when he dies, who are you gonna have left? You're gonna have fucking Cersei and Tommen, a fucking boy and a crazy fucking lady ruling Westeros? You know, you think they're gonna pay you back? Yeah, right. Stannis will pay you back because he doesn't just talk about fucking paying you back. He does it! <laughs> like, he shows his four fingers. That was, like, one of the... Be I love Sir Davos. Like, he's so pimp. So, yeah. So, that was cool. So, uh, they decide, yes, we will give you gold. And so, they decide to go back. And uh, since the White Walkers are coming, they know about the White Walkers. They are no longer interested in trying to attack King's Landing. Instead, they take their forces to the Wall... Uh, and they go help up there. So you see them at the very end of the season uh, helping John Castle Black by taking all the wildlings hostage and, you know, having their backs. But like I said, it's like Stannis is, like, not an easy dude to deal with, obviously, and, you know, all he wants is for people to say he's the fucking king and kneel to him, and then you have the king of the wall who's like, I'm fucking kneeling to you. Like, I've chopped my head off. I don't fucking care. And it's like, he's like, God damn it, won't just somebody fucking kneel to me? Ugh, it's so funny. Yeah, so Stannis finally gonna do it this season? We'll see. We'll see. It should be interesting. Like I, I said, he does it. I bet it's gonna happen. I, I am really excited to see Melisandre uh, on the wall. She's got some some metal, some things in store for Jon Snow and things like that. So that'll be really fun to see how that unfolds. So now let's talk about the Eerie. Where's that? Uh, that's on the east side of Westeros. The Lannisters are on the west side. The Eerie is the east side. So. What happens there? Okay, so after the Purple Wedding, uh, which we'll get to in a minute when we talk about King's Landing, uh, you have Sansa being spirited away to the Eyrie with Peter Baelish. Peter Baelish gets there. He marries Lysa immediately, who is uh, Sansa's aunt, who is Catelyn's sister. So she's a little crazy and fucked up. She's the one that's got that weird fucking kid, you know, and she's like coddling him. And he like, you know, is still breastfeeding and he's like, you know, aware. It's really weird. So yeah. Uh, so they get married, and then uh, Lysa starts getting really freaked out about Sansa because Sansa's like, you know, beautiful and the, the bloom of youth, you know, and all this stuff. And she knows that Peter wants to hit that, you know. I mean, it's pretty obvious. I mean, she looks like Kat supposedly when Kat was younger. So it's a whole thing. Lysa's like, yeah, Peter loves you. And then she sees Peter kiss her after, she, after Sansa slaps Robin for being a douche. 
And um, and then she's like threatening to throw her out the moon door. And then Peter throws her out the moon door, throws Lysa out the moon door. She goes flying. And then uh, you have all of the lords, the high lords of the Eerie who come together and they have this little this little questioning of Peter Baelish because nobody fucking trusts that guy, okay? Because he's a fucking snake, all right? Everybody knows he's a snake. And then Sansa comes in to testify on his behalf and ends up like mixing lies with truth and does a really great job of lying for the first time ever. I mean, she's finally using all the stuff that she learned in King's Landing to help herself. And she's not trying to help Peter, she's trying to help herself because she knows, she doesn't know what these people would do with her, whereas she has an idea of what fucking Peter's up to didn't want to live anymore. She stood on the edge of that moon door. He tried to reason with her, promised her she was the only one he had ever loved, but she stepped through those doors and she was... Sansa has finally learned the lesson that almost all the other Starks have never learned, which is the truth is not always the best policy. You know, sometimes that shit's just gonna get you in trouble and get your head chopped off. So Peter Baelish, if you may or may not remember, has always been in love with Catelyn Stark, okay? She used to be Catelyn Tully. They grew up together. It was this whole thing. He wanted to be with her. Uh, it was not gonna fucking happen. Even though Lysa was like, I wanna be with you. Peter's like, I wanna be with Catelyn. Cause you know, obviously Lysa's weird. So whatever, uh, now that Catelyn's dead, he has her daughter, you know? He's like, well, I'll take the next best thing I can get, which is Sansa. And also, let's not forget that Sansa's the motherfucking key to the North, all right? She is a Stark, so he has a claim on the North. So, I mean, he can, if he marries her or has somebody else marry her, I mean, that's essentially like, she's a big power player. Mm. Seriously. So Peter Baelish could take it all, theoretically. Peter Baelish is setting himself up real nice, all right? He ain't no fool. What will happen this season? Okay, so at the end of this season, you see that Sansa has gone dark. She's finally dyed her hair, uh, and she's going incognito as his niece, and she's wearing these, like, dark clothes and stuff, and now she's, like, I don't know, I guess super evil, too. I don't know. But she's definitely playing the game now. She's no longer a pawn in the Game of Thrones. She is a fucking player. Ooh. Yeah, and so now they're gonna start enacting some new plans. They're gonna get Robin and her out of the Eerie. Uh, they're gonna start setting up some some alliances and things like that. We'll see what what happens. It should be interesting. I'm excited to see Sansa kind of taking on a more mature role and her finally kind of growing up and not being such a whiny little weirdo with an empty head. So that'll be fun. <laughs> So the Hound, if you remember, has kidnapped Arya. She is kind of his hostage. He is taking her to the Eyrie to hopefully sell her to his aunt, where he will get gold for her, and then hopefully have enough to sail over to Essos and like join the Second Sons or something. That's his agenda. And uh, But along the way, he kind of softens towards Arya and starts teaching her more fucked up life lessons. Uh, he takes up her training as a killer, essentially. She goes from Sirio Pharrell to the Hound, who, you know, has a very interesting view on human life and death and things like that. She's getting a great internship on death from the Hound, essentially. Then what happens? So yeah, they're on their madcap adventures. They got it. They get in a couple scuffles. Uh, Arya is killing some folks. Pretty sweet. And then later on, they go. They finally make it to the Eyrie, and they're like, "Hey, we're here to pass the bloody gate. We we want to. Uh, this is Arya Stark, and you know." and I want to talk to Lysa. And they're like, sorry, Lysa just died three days ago. So Arya starts laughing. Arya has a great grasp of irony at this age. And so they go on and like, he's trying to kind of figure out his next move now. Cause he's like, fuck, my whole plan is ruined. What are we going to do now? So while they're fucking dicking around, uh, at the very end of the season, you have them bumping into Brienne of Tarth and Podrick Payne. Uh, Brienne is looking for Sansa, but ends up finding Arya instead. Uh, knows that she's alive after talking to Hot Pie in a inn somewhere. This very fortuitous little meeting that never happened in the books, but whatever. Uh, so yeah, uh, it was really cute. I really enjoyed Arya and Brienne's interaction at first because uh, Arya's like, wait, do you know how to use that sword? And she's like, I do. And she's like, well, who taught you? And you know, she's like, oh, she's so cool. She's a badass lady fighter. You know, she's essentially like being proven right that she can be a badass lady fighter because she sees this chick doing it and she's like, yeah, she's fucking awesome. But anyways, there's a big misunderstanding. Uh, she's like, hey, come with me. You know, I am told to keep you safe. 
And the Hound's like, uh, you were sent by the Lannisters. I'm looking at your fucking Lannister gold, fucking Oathkeeper, Valerian steel sword, so fuck you. And second of all, if you think there's anywhere that's safe, you're the wrong person to be looking after her, which he kind of has a point, because where the fuck is she gonna take Arya exactly? Like, there's nowhere for her to go. So the Hound and Brienne get into an all-out fight. It was one of the best fights. Again, this didn't happen in the books, but I really enjoyed it anyways. It's important to note that during this fight, the Hound has been weakened because he was bit by Biter, and he has an infection in his neck, and he wouldn't let Arya burn it out because he's afraid of fire. So he's like not fighting at full strength necessarily. Uh, but him, he gives Brienne a pretty good fight, but Brienne ends up besting him by kicking him off a cliff, and he rolls down, he gets a compound fracture, and then uh, Arya hides from oh, Brienne. Yeah. You know, Brienne's trying to find Arya. Arya's like, fuck you, I'm gonna oh, go yeah. my own way. I don't need you. And so she goes down to the Hound. The Hound says, you know, kill me please. Like, I'm in so much pain right now. And she does it just to be a dick. I Why? Think. Why didn't she kill him? Well, okay, so there's two reasons behind this. I don't like that she didn't kill him because they're so close and they're so charismatic together in the show that I felt like she would have shown him that mercy. Um, but the thing was, in the books, uh, she also does not kill him. He gets also an infection, and he's like, please kill me, and she doesn't, and she just leaves him alive. And the thing is, is like, you never see the hound die in the books. And it's assumed that he's dead, but you never see that he's dead. So who knows? He could still be alive, and maybe they didn't kill him <gasps> off in the show. I love the hound. Because he shows up later. But I don't dead? know, because I don't know in the books either. He's coming back? <laughs> don't get your hopes up, okay? <gasps> oh I'm just God. saying, maybe, but... <laughs> don't get your hopes up, all right? I don't know. So Arya uh, finds a dude who's got some ships. She's like, take me to the wall. She's trying to get to John. He's like, I'm not going to the wall. I'm going to Bravos. Like, fuck you. And she's like, gives him the coin that Jack and Hagar had give her. She How did you? Valamogolis. Valamogolis. He's like, oh shit, you might be one of those fucking guys. So, you know, Valar Doris, you can have a nice room. We'll do whatever you want. And she is on her way to Bravos, which is so exciting. I love Bravos. I love Arya. I love Arya in Bravos. I am really looking forward to seeing Arya in Bravos. That is like the number one thing I'm looking forward to next season. That's it for part one of our Game of Thrones season four recap. Continue to part two to hear about Danny and Marine and all about King's Landing and the Lannister family drama. I also want to invite you to subscribe to my channel. It's free. You'll see when I have a new friggin' video coming up. It's awesome. And also, I suggest checking out our Epic History X-Men Volume 1. If you enjoyed our Epic Histories for Game of Thrones, you may enjoy this. It's the same format, except even better. We perfected it. And instead of talking about Game of Thrones, we're talking about the X-Men. And there's a lot to talk about with the X-Men. Trust me. So check it out on Vimeo On Demand on sale now. Uh, also follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for all your Comic Book Girl 19 updates. That's where we post our videos. We also post things like if we're going to be somewhere or whatever. It's all sorts of news and updates on there. So if you're new to the Comic Book Girl 19 channel and our Game of Thrones content, I implore you to go check out our Epic History series for Game of Thrones. We've done Epic History on the Lannisters, the Starks, the Baratheons, and the Targaryens. You get to know where these houses came from, why they have beef with one, each other, one another, all that sort of good stuff. Uh, they're super long, they're super awesome. 